well, we got a very exciting training today, so I'm excited about it, and uh, I'm happy to go over it with you guys. Um, so as you guys saw from the email that Olivia sent out, and as you kind of gathered as we kind of focus on what our objectives and key results are going to be here for Q4, what we really want to focus on is setting ourselves up not only to get loans now, but to drastically increase the pool of people that we can be getting loans from next year and give ourselves more exposure. And so what we really want to focus on, and just very simply this is, how do we continue to build meaningful relationships with our My25 and give ourselves either more wallet share with people that are already referring to us or get that first referral from that person that we've been hunting down? And then we want to do 50 live interviews or collisions and Ford conversations with realtors that we have not done business with before to see if they're people that potentially belong in our My25. And so that is the game that we're playing here as we go into Q4. What will that do for you? Well, let me give you an example. If we limit our collisions in our My25, and we should be limiting this, especially if you've been doing this a while. If you're brand new, I have a little more leniency on some of these, I don't wanna call them rules, but let's call them guidelines for our My25. But essentially we should only be considering spending time with loan office, uh, realtors, I'm sorry, that have had at least three buy sides in the last 12 months. All right, that's our minimum. So if I interview 50 new realtors in Q4 that had at least three buy sides over the last 12 months, the average probably had probably about five or plus buy sides, right? If the minimum's three, I'm gonna be an average about five. That's 250 potential deals now that I'm exposing myself to for next year that I will have a chance at based on those interviews. And that's in addition to what I've already given myself a chance with, with my My25. So when you guys think about how to take advantage of that, the first thing is, and tomorrow for training, I want you guys to actually bring your list of your My25s to the training so that we can kind of go through and, and make sure we have the right people on the list. But do they have at least three buy sides? Are these people that I potentially do still want to work with? I think they're a good match for me and my business. We have shared similar values. I don't feel like I'm selling my soul or dealing with somebody who's going to make my life miserable just because they have a lot of production when we do those things. And so we're going to continue to dive into the quality of our My25 tomorrow. But what I want to do today is focus on two specific things. One is part of that My25 is we're going to have we want to have three meaningful conversations or one a month with them over the course of the quarter. How do we how do we figure out what those interactions are? And then secondly, when we're having our Ford conversations, what is a Ford conversation and how do we want to, when we're doing those interviews, how do we make that happen? Okay. So as far as, and I believe I, correct me if I'm wrong on the order of this, because I didn't check the email from Olivia Day. We're doing the Ford conversation part today and the My25 part tomorrow, right? Somebody help me out and support me. Is that what we sent out? Sweet. Okay. So let's talk about our Ford conversations. Does anybody want to tell me? who's been a really good student, what Ford stands for? Family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. Cool. Who was that? It was me, Natalia. Oh, I can't see you, Natalia, but I do Sorry, hear you. Sorry, I'm changing a diaper. <laughs> Fair enough. Family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. So this is not something that Mark Gordon invented. This is something that Ninja talks about all the time in terms of building relationships. And there's some version of this in kind of every sales, right? But the answer is, who do people do business with? What are the four things that Ninja says you need from somebody for them to refer business to you? They have to what? Know, like, and trust. And? I can't, I don't know the four. Be in flow. Be in flow, right? They have to know you, they have to like you, they have to trust you, and they have to be in flow with you, okay? So we want to take 50 new people this quarter, get them to know us, get them to like us, potentially start to build trust, and then get those people into our flow system that's built for you here at Princeton Mortgage by our amazing marketing team so to get them in there so we can keep you in flow with those people going forward. Couple that with your social media and your live flow, which is these Ford conversations, and you're going to see, it's going to feel to them like you're everywhere, okay? So family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. Are those things generally that come up in conversations with people you meet? Yeah, really, it kind of covers everything, right? What are some things that you talk about that aren't those things? Is there anything that we have, you meet a stranger, you have a conversation, anything you talk about that doesn't fit into one of those four categories? I haven't put any thought into it, but nothing's coming to mind right now, okay? So 
Now, what I will say is you're going to have the natural parts of four that you gravitate towards, okay? But the reason, why do, I guess, first of all, why do people stop prospecting or not prospect generally? They get comfortable. Comfortable, right? But why is it even, why is it uncomfortable to prospect? We're afraid of no? Yeah, we're afraid of rejection, right? Evolutionarily, rejection can literally be the difference between life and death. If you lived in a small tribe of 25 people that are dependent on each other for life and death, and those people reject you, you can literally be out in the woods all alone. And so the same fight or flight responses to rejection exist in us today from an evolutionary perspective. It feels, what, think about, think about have you ever met somebody or had somebody you didn't know, and they're suddenly rude to you, and you get anxiety, and it literally feels like you might die? Like suddenly you have this like physiological reaction that doesn't even make sense. Like, I don't even know this person. Why do I care what they think? But suddenly, like, they've rejected you in some way, and you're like, <gasps> and you're like, and you're, it's like, that's because we have this evolutionary tool, which, by the way, can be used for you. It's the reason why we want to be liked. It's the reason why we think about how to be liked. And so we're afraid of that. And so what we want to do when we're prospecting is take away any fear of rejection. How do we take away fear of rejection in sales? Keep it about the other person and then you're they're not because they'll they just cling to you if you're it's about them. Yeah, think about it. I'm not gonna ask this person for anything. This is an interview to see if this is somebody that I want to work with. So when I go into my open houses, have a collision with a realtor, if I'm cold calling realtors, and by the way, I think we this may be the rare time period, by the way, in Q4 where I think cold calling realtors can be a great way to have collisions, and I'm gonna talk about that on this call today. It's, I don't think you're ever going to have an easier time. By the way, I thought the pandemic was a pretty easy time to get in flow with realtors and meet new realtors, and it was at the beginning. But then people got very busy. There was business falling from the sky, and so people weren't really interested in learning anymore. They got it. Rates are low. Things are fine. They wanted to be educated those first couple of months, and they moved on. When things are difficult like this and things are changing the way they are, realtors are looking for information. I'll tell you, I have at least one realtor a day. And keep in mind, I am not a loan officer. I am somebody who puts out information about the mortgage industry, but I have one realtor a day. Half of them are people I've never met before, but find me through social media or through somebody else asking me for information about what's going on in the mortgage industry. And I'm going to talk to you guys today and tomorrow about what some of those things are because realtors are thirsty right now. They are thirsty for lending information or for any leg that's going to help them have a conversation with their clients for why this is a good time to buy. Because what is conventional wisdom right now? This is a bad time to buy. Rates are high, prices are high, people think prices are gonna come down, people don't know what's available to them, and so everyone is afraid. And what happens when, when there's uncertainty, or when there's perceived uncertainty, because I think there's always uncertainty, but when people are perceiving the uncertainty, they get locked up. And so realtors are looking for answers, right? Where are they gonna get those answers? Hopefully from loan officers. Now ask yourself about the other loan officers you know in your community. How many of them are really good at educating realtors, like doing it, spend time doing it, do it out of the kindness of their heart, enjoy having those interactions? It's probably not many. Maybe it's one or two, and those are probably the most successful ones. So there's a void that you can fill. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. Fred, what are we going to talk about? I just wanted to follow up. So what we're going through, that uncomfortableness is also what I'm seeing in realtors as well, because I think they got a little bit too comfortable with list, 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 easy, 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 easy. I only want listings. Now you're starting to see that like those listings aren't there and they're not afraid, but those uncomfortable conversations with new clients and whatnot, having to drive them around. So I feel like any kind of conversations I've had with team members of other teams and whatnot with realtors has been welcomed more now than like the end of the, or the middle of the pandemic and all that because they just didn't have time and now they yeah. need buyers i find that there are two types of realtors and I, I i do through my social life here and and my and what i do for work I meet a lot of realtors there are two kinds right now three really one is they don't even do enough business and they're kind of new and they don't even know what they're getting themselves into but of the other two there are the people that are outwardly panicked and the people that are pretending they're not panicked but they're all panicked right now because they're all dealing with something they haven't dealt with before, right? And some of them are telling themselves stories. I've been doing this for 20 years, I've done this before. Well, the answer is every market's different and certainly things are different right now, right? When you think about the mortgage industry, like, well, it's like, I've been in the industry for 30 years, I've seen rates this high before. It's like, yes, 
But we were living on a different planet 20 years ago when rates were this high. There was barely internet. There was no Facebook. There was no social media. People were getting the, you know, the, the, the amount of the mortgage industry itself was mostly still big banks doing the mortgage stuff. It was the Wells Fargo's and the cross countries. It is a very different world. And so we're in a new time, right? Now, so if you have real agents that are thirsty for information and we can arm you guys with that information and help you build meaningful relationships, this is a unique moment, right? Now you said you, you may be saying you're telling yourself a story. I don't know enough or feel comfortable enough to educate my realtors on what's going on. Great. If you spent four hours this morning reading everything you could on Google about what's going on in the market right now, you would know more than 99% of realtors. It would happen for you that fast. Practice your routine, go out and start talking to them about it. Just pass them the articles, give them somebody else's words if you want. They're thirsty for information and they don't know where to get it, right? Very successful realtor reached out to me today, telling me she from New Jersey. I haven't seen her in four and a half years since I moved to Charleston. I really would like to work more closely with you and Nicole. I have a bunch of questions about how I can explain this stuff to my borrowers. I saw you did this video a while back. You know, would you do? Would you help me do one? R randomly this morning, reaching out, right? Because I've positioned myself as somebody who has the answers through my social media. People are now coming to me with their questions. And that's what you want to be doing with your social media and your and your different information in these board conversations. So family, occupation, recreation, or dreams. Know, like, trust, and inflow with. Okay. So if realtors don't know you, you're a secret loan officer, right? Then then you're not going to get business. I know very few loan officers that don't have huge presence that do a ton of business. There's one guy here in Charleston who I don't see anywhere and somehow did 200 million last year. I've I've met him a couple of times. Still doesn't really make sense to me. I don't know how he does it. Everybody else that I know who's doing huge business has huge presence. Everybody knows them. Okay. So you got to be known. How do you get known? Reach out, do the social media stuff, get these board conversations going. So it's about family. For some of you guys, this may be your go to. For me, it's not. Generally, I'm not really interested in learning about the other person's family. That may make me sound like a cold, awful person. It's not that I don't care about their family. If something happened to them, I would care. But the fact that they have two kids, what their kids' names are and where they go to school, I find completely uninteresting, and I'm not going to pretend, okay? The people who lead with family on this stuff generally will find some other loan officer to work with because that's not my value proposition, and that's okay. Occupation, for anybody who knows me socially, is it something that I always end up talking about. I love knowing what people do for work. When people don't are in a different industry, I'll ask them a million questions about their job. I have a friend who went recently to be an engineer and work for Mercedes down here. Every time I see him, I have a hundred questions about how they run their company, how different things are done, whatever it is. I'm fascinated with how big companies are run and how they make decisions. So I end up asking a ton of questions when I meet somebody about work and their jobs. I'm genuinely interested. I want to know how things are going. I'm also, because I've read a lot of books on how companies work and how real estate, real estate agents do their jobs, can provide value sometimes through opportunity when I ask those questions. So it ends up being something I'm very interested in. Recreation, what people do for fun. Generally, I like to have fun. I generally don't care what you do for fun. The fact that you're into fishing or whatever else it is is generally not that interesting to me. Now, if you happen to be a rugby player and I play rugby, sure, great, but that's not going to be my go-to, right? I'm not asking, what are you doing this weekend? That, that generally is not interesting for me. It might be for you. Dreams, where people want to go with their lives, fascinating to me since I was a little kid. I was a psychology major in school. I love figuring out where people want to go and what made them the way they are, and I'll dive into those things. So my Ford conversations generally focus on occupation and dreams. Those are the things that I end up talking about. I have other people that work here that are the other way around completely. It's all about what are you doing for fun and what's going on with your family. It doesn't matter what your jam is, but you need to have one or two of these areas that you're very comfortable, not only learning about other people, but you must reveal about you. So you want them doing 70 to 80% of the talking in these interviews, but when you're talking, you need to be able to reveal at least quickly. So does anybody question? So I, I want to kind of pose it as a question. How many of you guys think that of those four things, the thing that you talk about most naturally when you meet strangers is either your family or their family? Chet, anybody else? Paige, Fred, Dan? Carissa, awesome, right? By the way, if you have little kids, 
this is a much easier transition conversation than if you don't, right? It just is for a lot of people, right? That's the one thing they relate to, right? For how many of you guys is it work? Immediately you're going into how are things going in the business? How, what have you seen changing in the industry right now? Um, those things, Ray says he's a work person. I'm definitely work first. What about for the rest of you guys? That's it, right? What about recreation? I'm talking about fishing. I'm talking about golfing. I'm talking about Anthony, Beth, Kate. I've seen some people haven't raised their hands at all yet, right? Eddie, the fun guy. Anybody here, Nick? Anybody here a dreams person? Beth and Anthony, John, Dan. All right, good. Know where you stand on this stuff and then be very thoughtful about, hey, what are my stories? Because your things, we talk about your family and the way you talk about your family, by the way, is your brand. I will tell you that there are people that because of the way they talk about their husband or their wives are people that I don't like to spend time with. I think it reflects super poorly on them. Right. I just, it just, it, and by the way, like, it's not like a thoughtful thing. It's like a, oh, it's like my reaction is like, wow, you're living. If you're talking to me about your husband or wife that way, it means every day you go home, you're probably living a huge lie. That's very hard for me to get past in terms of the way I think about certain things. I think that's why I don't go into the family stuff right now because sometimes I don't want to know. Right? I think it might push me away from somebody I could otherwise want to do business with. And so integrity is a huge piece of this, right? Um, and so think about what are your stories, right? So if I'm going to go the family route, I know what I talk about. I'm, I'm the guy who like, who acts a little bit punch drunk over what it's like to have three little kids, right? I'm always complaining with, complaining about them with a smile while I tell you how much I love them. That's kind of what I talk about and how I do it if I'm going to do it, right? When I'm talking about work, it's my passion for it. I love helping other people get to where they want to go. I love learning about different things in business. I love all those things. And so my passion then is how can I help you with your passion? I try to find that similar passion in other people. People who like work as a sport, right? I love that. When I'm talking about recreation, it's usually things like fantasy football or football or sports. And those are things I can relate to people on. If someone's a sports fan, it's usually a thing I can really jump into them with on the sports, right? What are your things that you talk about for recreation? How do you relate, right? Anthony's probably looking for somebody he can get on the golf course with. That's awesome, right? If I was as good at golf as Anthony is, I'd be doing the same thing. Unfortunately for me, I'm embarrassing on the golf course. So... And then your dreams. Hey, what what are you? If you you in order you're, if you're going to ask somebody about their dreams, you need to be comfortable sharing yours, and you need to be, have those things well baked. And so when you think about, hey, what are the things when I meet a stranger, that is a potential referral partner, I'm having these board conversations. What are the things that I'm comfortable talking about? And it's okay by the way to discover new things as you go, but put them into your memory bank. The more confident you are in your script, right? You may not be confident meeting new people, but if you're confident in your script and the things that you like to talk about, then you will project way more confidence in that conversation. And that trust that that person is looking for is built on the fact that you're competent and confident in what you do, right? Realtors are looking for confidence when they're looking for loan officers. If you, don't, if you can't handle an initial conversation, they're gonna think you can't handle that with their clients, they're not gonna refer people to you. And this is not a conscious decision they make, it's a subconscious one. When we talk about trust, what we're really talking about is competence. Rarely are we talking about like most of you guys, none of, I can't, none of you guys give off a vibe of sliminess. I'm not talking about that kind of trust. When we talk about trust here, it's competence. When things go wrong, is this the kind of person that's going to stay calm under pressure and knows their way around the stuff and can get the answers and figure it out? That's what they're looking for. And so that also means being confident in those conversations. Okay. So if you're going into forward conversations where you know, how many of you guys have ever been to a networking event? Name a name tag networking event, anybody? Cool. What is the physiological feeling you get before that? So I'm sure it's different for everybody. Anybody here like gets really excited about it? Like this is their jam. I'm so excited about meeting all these new people. I do, I'm weird. I'm so, I'm so jealous. You have no idea how jealous I am. Because I think, by the way, I think most people would would tell you that, like, oh, I come off as super confident, and I, you know, I'm, and I'm an extrovert. All those things are true. Meeting new people, I find exhausting. Like, I have to be on. There is a prep situation for me to go into that situation with the right frame of mind, and a lot of times it requires one drink to get me going. 
right? Take the edge off, right? It's just true. It's how I'm wired. I know myself. So when I do that, I have my ritual. I listen to the same music before I go into those types of situations where I know I'm going to meet people. I get myself in the right frame of mind. I start role playing the things that I'm going to ask other people about. Not necessarily talk about for me. I know my stories, but I start role playing things about what am I going to be interested in with these other people? For this group, what are the questions of the moment that might want to make sense? When we put together our script right now for our branch managers who are calling loan officers for recruiting, our, our icebreaker question is, how are you handling the changes in the market? That doesn't that that may usually work for a lot of different markets, but it, it particularly applies today. It's something that people are eager to talk about. So when I go in having my four conversations with somebody new, I want to bring something up that this person's eager to talk about. Right? If I see somebody wearing a sports shirt, I'm always going to bring that up, right? Because now I'm comfortable in that realm. And it's a way for me to get them to talk about something that they're probably comfortable talking about. If you're wearing an Eagles shirt like Jamie. You're probably excited to talk about the Eagles right now, especially if they're 4-0, right? And so that's an amazing way for me to break in with somebody and have that initial forward conversation. Now, some other things I want you guys to think about in these forward conversations, because again, these are, these are interviews, 50 interviews. And what are you trying to determine with this person? Is this person worth spending more time with? Do they potentially belong inside my My25? Now, I want to be clear. If you hate this person, okay? You're like, this is the worst human being I've ever met. You still want them to like you because they are in your business, in your field. And so you want to, you want them to walk away liking you. You still want to put them into your marketing system. You still want to send them a handwritten note card. You're just not going to spend any time working on that person or that relationship moving forward. But you do want as many people out there as fans of you as possible. So remember the mission at the end of your, your five minute Ford conversation Three to five minutes, guys, you keep this quick. And let, um, now if they're talking and they're loving it, let them go. But if any of it feels forced, it's better to be in and out. Because I want this person to think the next time I talk to them, it's also going to be a low investment, quick conversation. You guys, all those people that every, like, maybe you have some of your family who calls you every time they call, it's 30 minutes to get them off the phone. You never have time for that call. You have somebody else in your family that when they're calling, it's because they need something and it takes 30 seconds. You always have time for that call. You want to lean towards that person, being that person with this stuff. Okay, quick hits. So I want to get in. I want this person to know me and like me at the end of this conversation. I want to be able to connect with them on social media. It's them a handwritten note card so I can start to build trust. And I want to be able to stay in flow with this person. Okay. So I want them to like me. 50 interviews. While I'm getting them to like me, I'm going to decide this is somebody I want to invest more time in. Okay. Now for you guys, just like if you were interviewing a loan officer assistant for you, you need to start thinking about what are the things I'm looking for that are most important to me in someone that is going to be a referral partner for me. So as you guys sit here and think about this today, I, I mean, I mean, I mean a new realtor. I'm at a networking. I'm at a network. I'm in a room full. Let's say I'm sponsoring a realtor event. There's a hundred realtors in the room, and I only have three hours at this event. What are the things I'm looking for that are going to determine if this is somebody I want to work with? And by the way, I'd like you guys to be honest with yourself about how you've been making decisions previously and also how you think you should be making decisions moving forward. Because I know that my instinct for this, if I follow it, is not what I actually think I should be doing. So let me say that again. What have you been doing? How In that situation, how have you been determining if someone should be someone that you pursue? And how should you be determining if this is a relationship that you should pursue? Anybody want to share? Yeah, go ahead. So I, I usually go towards people that are talkative like myself, but recently um, there's two realtors uh, personally that are kind of like standoffish. And I feel like it's my mission to figure out why they're so standoffish. So as uncomfortable it is for me, it's almost like a game right now to like do little things to find out A, if their problem is me or B, if they just have a hard shell to crack. I love that. So, Maybe okay. opposite of what I usually do. No, I think that's and I, and I think I'm gonna I'm gonna let a couple other people share, and then I want to hop back to you because I think there's some good points in there. Anybody else? How are you determining who you want to who you want to build these meaningful relationships with? And go ahead, I need to shout them out. Anybody can go. Mark, being new, I'm just kind of all over the place. But what I heard Dan Cooley say one time is, "Find your people." So. I mean, I'm just trying to find people that I would be friends with if we weren't in business together. 
And I seem to be getting more from them than anybody, but it may not be like the mo the biggest agent in town. So good. I'm going to talk about that in a minute too. Anthony, what about you? Um, I, I try to find somebody that I can fill their gaps, if that makes sense. A lot of agents are real personable and they no, might not be very organized and they might not be very whatever. So they can like really rely on me to stay organized and make them look good. Um, I think that's just the value that I try to add. Yeah, I think that's very interesting too. This is great. This is actually a really great question to think about because so first of all, here's my instinct. If I'm being honest with you, the number one way I would determine in the past, like from a natural instinct, forget thought, is, oh, this person likes me, I'm gonna make sure I work this relationship. How weird is that, right? When I get the vibe that someone likes me, suddenly I want to invest in that person. Now, maybe the reason they like me is because they suck and they think I'm great, and now I'm wasting a bunch of time in a relationship with somebody who doesn't provide any value, or maybe, they're, they're, whatever the answer is, like the number one degree factor should not be whether that person likes you, but that if I'm being honest, that's probably a big part of, of how I've made some, some of these decisions in the past, right? It's like, oh, this person likes me, it's gonna be easy for me then to work with them. And so I'm taking the path of least resistance because someone is showing like. And I think, Fred, I think what you were kind of describing with that is somebody who talks a lot, like me. And the answer is like, actually, I think this person is gonna be easy for me to work with because they're like me and they like me. Right. And so those things are fine things to look at, but maybe they shouldn't be the number one priority. Anthony, I love your approach in theory. One issue with it is you're relying on realtors to be self aware. So now a realtor is say, my skill set is personable skills. My problem is organization. I want to partner with somebody who's not like me. I think there are some people that are like that. I think the vast majority of people are probably looking for someone who's more like them. And so I'm not saying to you that you're doing it wrong. I'm saying something to be aware of, which is like, man, you may have a realtor out there that's like, I would be the perfect partner for that person, but they don't see it because maybe they don't even have their self-awareness or they're not, or they just undervalue organization on the whole because they've been able to be successful without it. Right. Or their terms of success. Right. So I think a self-aware realtor, I think would be right up your alley. I think if someone's lacking some of that self-awareness, it's a, it's a longer road. Um, and so as you guys think about this, it's what, what we should be to me, what makes anybody here ever been a part of in sports or in a debate team or any part of life or even in work where they were part of a really special team. They're like, man, my team, this is a special team. Anybody, what makes a team special? It's a good I mean, question. App. What? So uh, besides skill, I mean, it's going to be like general camaraderie, you know, how, how do you guys get along with each other in a sense? And can you work together as a team? You ever been part of a team where everybody really liked each other and the team sucked? Yeah. I yeah. I have. You have a really good time. I've seen a lot of rugby teams where the guys really love each other and they're a bad team. <laughs> to me, I think while those things are important and they help. What makes a special team is that everybody on the team is working towards the same thing and has the same dreams, the same end goal, right? And then the goal of the, because of that, you build trust with that group. So the goals of the collective become more important than your individual goal and everybody's working towards that same thing. So if I'm trying to find a real estate agent that I'm going to have a really significant partnership, I'm gonna be looking for somebody who shares similar ambitions to how they want their life to look as I do. Now that may seem like, well, you want the most ambitious realtor. Well, maybe some of you guys don't. If you're not the most ambitious loan officer, if you're not trying to do a billion dollars a year, then like you probably don't, you're probably not gonna get along with the real estate agent that wants to be the number one real estate agent in South Carolina. And that's fine. You don't need that person. But if you wanna attract somebody who's super ambitious, then you need to be super ambitious. And you should be aware of those things. If you want to find somebody who's like, man, I really like my work, but I also like my family. I put in 40 hours a week. And I do the best job I can. By the way, my, my number one most important thing is my clients uh, love me at the end of the process. And that's who you are. Then you guys have similar goals, right? And so what we should be looking for and interviewing for is whether someone's an extrovert or an introvert, whether they talk a lot or they don't, whether or not I like want to hang out with them or not. The answer is, what are, where are they going in their careers? What's their mission for their clients? What are the things they, they prioritize in terms of how they do business? 
right? And do we share that path? Can we work together to help each other achieve our individual goals? And then can we have a collective goal as to how we approach our individual clients? Anybody here have a real estate partner they feel like they have that special relationship with or a couple? Yeah, right? And by the way, probably this, those are probably pretty drama free, those relationships, right? They know that you care about the same things they care about, you guys are working together. And so the first thing is, that's why we spend all this time at Princeton talking about our objectives and key results, because I want you guys to know what your why is and where you're going, right? Because if you don't know what your why is and where you're going, how will you be able to find the people like you on the same path? You have to be able to self-identify those things first. And so as we approach Q4 with our 50 interviews, and that's how I want you guys to think of it, I had to find 50 uh, potential referral partners, probably realtors, to interview this quarter, which is five a week for 10 weeks or four a week for 13 weeks, whatever it is you got to do, figure it out. But if you guys aren't, if you haven't already done three, you're behind schedule. And we're going to keep bringing it up like that. You got to be doing basically, you want to be trying to do one interview every workday, or you want to be doing five on the weekends, whatever it is you need to do. When you're doing your interviews is, man, I want to go find some realtors that are making it but want to take their business to the next level because I'm a loan officer who's making it, but wants to get to the next level. And by the way, if you go back to our five levels of mastery webinar, we can do another training on that for some of our newer guys here as well. If you're operating as a high level one or a low level two, and you want to get to a high level two or a low level three, those are probably the realtors you're going to focus on. Right? People who really want to put in the work to get to that next stage in their development. And by the way, it's actually what you're probably going to have is you're going to actually attract people who are slightly not as good as you most of the time who can look up to you so that you can lead them in that growth process. They share your ambitions, but you're a little bit out in front. If you're spending a bunch of, if your My25 consists of a bunch of realtors that are the very best in the industry, but you just started out as a loan officer, and you still don't know what you're talking about, that is going to be a very difficult hill to climb. Right? The law of the lid says you're going to need to be as good or slightly better than them to attract them to want to work with you, or at least in their head. Right? They're going to have to think those things. So we're going to dive into the My25 list tomorrow together as a group. Bring your list. If you don't have a list for My25, make one between now and tomorrow. Prioritize it. Figure it out. You need to have 25 realtors that you think kind of fit some of the things we talked about today, but we'll get into the rest of that tomorrow. And if you already have a list, don't change it between now and tomorrow. We're going to dive into these things differently. The mission should be to replace the bottom seven or eight people on that My25 list. And you should rank them, by the way. So anyone that you currently do business with and want to keep doing business with should be in your My25. Anyone who is on your wish list to be able to do business with should be on your My25. Anyone that you want to invest time into relationship with should be in your My25. Great. The 50 people are people you're interviewing this quarter because you want to replace at least five, if not six, seven, eight of those My 25s and say, okay, cool. After my three interactions with that My 25 this quarter, I realized this is somebody I actually don't want to do business with. Maybe this person's not going to be successful. Maybe they're at the end of their career and they're bowing out. Maybe they're going through some things in their life right now that make them not the right fit for me. I want to replace them with somebody else. Because here's another thing that's very, that becomes very obvious as you go through this. When you have a bunch of realtors who are referring to you, you become much looser and then more attractive to other realtors when you meet them. When you are desperate to try to find business anywhere you can, people will sense that on you. And so the power dynamic shifts. And so if you meet 50 realtors every quarter and interview them, within a year, you're gonna know most, if not all of the top players in your area. And they're all going to know you. And assuming that you're doing the things to like you and build trust, right? Then suddenly the power dynamic is flipped, right? When a realtor is like insecure because they only know one or two loan officers or they, they know less realtors or people in the game than you do, suddenly you become the connector for them, right? Do you know this realtor? I'm putting an offer in this house. Do you know this realtor? I know that realtor. I can, you know, I can call them. You, you'll start to know everybody, right? And it's just, it's just 50, 50 a quarter, right? Four or five a week interviews. How long should the interviews be? Four conversations, five minutes. Get to know them, get them to know you, get in, get out, make sure they like you, send them the handwritten note card, put them in the 13 by 30, let the magic start working. 
right? And again, even if you decide 30 seconds in, let's say they walk over and the hair in the back of your neck stands up, but you're gonna have the Ford conversation anyway, what is your job? Do the interview, get them to like you, put them in the system, let them say good things about you when someone brings up their name. Don't invest in the relationship, right? Those 25 people are the ones that you're sending birthday cards to, Christmas gifts to, thoughtful things along the way, a book that reminds you of them, you're going out to lunch with once a month, you're having those individual phone calls with, you're sharing a, an article or a story or something you learned in training with those people. Another part of what we're gonna focus on tomorrow and next week is our information in our 2-1 buy down program, which we're gonna be rolling out on Friday. This is an absolute no brainer, very easy way for you to both have collisions, but more importantly, a reason for you to get together with everybody in your My 25 this month. So you can go over with them how they can set their buyers up for success by getting the sellers to contribute the money towards the cost of the 2-1 buy down, okay? So sellers assist towards the cost of a 2-1 buy down will we'll make the buying process much more um, reasonable for somebody who's looking to shop in this market, right? And by the way, for people doing listings, if they offer a seller's assist as part of their listing, they will attract more buyers because this 2-1 buy down is kind of the cheat code right now for anyone who thinks that rates are high now and they're going to come down over the next two years. You can get that lower payment for the next year or two and then go ahead and refinance at some point in the future. And you can do it without any other additional cost other than that seller's assist. So we're going to talk about that a little bit tomorrow. Next week, we're going to have I'm going to build out a presentation for you guys, you know, a PowerPoint that you guys will be able to go over with realtors on the 2-1 buy down and how to take advantage of it. Well, you guys should start setting people up. Hey, have you heard of the 2-1 buy down program? I'd love to go over it with you. Have those calls today, those check-ins, set up meetings for later this month to go over with them and start to repair them for those offers. It will be the hot thing and everyone's gonna be willing to have a conversation with you about it. The only people that are not are the ones who maybe just went to a presentation from another loan officer, but it, this is gonna be the thing everyone's talking about over the next two months. And so we're going to hand that to you as a PowerPoint that you can go and have those conversations with your My25 and continue to build those meaningful relationships. This is the playbook, guys. There's not if you want to grow your business, this is the way to do it. And if you don't do it, your business will not grow. And so if there's all kinds of, you know, I'm trying to make trying to boil it down to like the most simple thing. You got to have a My25 you're focused on. And I the picture I get in my head when I talk about my MI25, and by the way, if anybody does this extra credit and, and I'll fall in love with you, have pictures of those 25 realtors, put them on a board mafia style with little, with like your, with your pins up there with their pictures and know everything about them. That's Betty. Her kids are Ruth Ann and Jane and they're eight and six. And Jane is the top gymnast for the eight year olds. And blah, 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 and you know everything about those My25 and you should have like, almost like you're uh, in the FBI and you're investigating organized crime. That's how you should be thinking about your 25 realtors. You wanna know everything about these people, right? So my job is to become an expert in these 25 people and provide them value. My other job is constantly making sure that I have the right people in my organized crime family tree. So I got to go out and do 50 new interviews with other realtors to see if they belong on the top of my organized crime tree. That is the job. The rest of it is noise. Right? So when you think about, do you have the skills, the information to be able to go crush that? What do you need to brush up on? What do you need to fill out? Hey, I got my 25 people. These are my people. Some of them are referring, but I want to... Hey, I want to make sure that that group represents 450 loans for next year, potential loans on buy sides, whatever the number is. And I'm going to want to be able to get a third of those. That's my business, right? The other piece of it is who can I be interviewing to see if they belong in that group? By the way, 25 is at the high end. It's hard to have 25 meaningful relationships. It's impossible to have more than that. Do not try. So some people get in here and they're like, I don't know. I have more than 25. It's like, then you don't really know what it means to have a meaningful relationship. Most of us don't have 25 meaningful relationships in our entire life, let alone 25 with referral partners. You cannot invest in more than 25 people at a time. Questions about that stuff? Was this helpful? Family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. What are your scripts? What are the things you like to talk about? What are the questions you like to ask? How can you get confident in your ability to have that five minute conversation, even if you're not yet 100% confident in your ability to be a great loan officer? 
How can you portray those different things? How can you make those conversations about them? They do 70% of the talking, you do 30% of the talking. You're interviewing them for a spot in your My25. At the same time, you have to make them like you. Leave them wanting more. End the conversation a little too early. It's okay to get pulled away. It's okay to get a text message or pretend you got a text message and say, hey, I have to call this person. So nice to meet you. Get out of the conversation and leave them wanting more, right? You cannot develop a meaningful relationship for the next 20 years in a five minute conversation, but you can cost yourself one. So leave them wanting a little bit more. Um, any other thoughts or questions regarding this topic? How many of you guys right now have a My25 list that you're like, dude, I got this. I know these people. This is my list. Come up with 25 names. Say, it, I, it would be better to start with a terrible list that you continuously stare at and iterate than it is not to have a list or be afraid to start your list. Just get 25 names in there and then start to iterate. If you maybe you maybe if you do a good job this quarter, you end up replacing 15 of your 25. That's okay, right? It's almost like we, we just want to start building the habit of focusing on those 25 people. 